Hello and welcome to another time of Bible teaching. And have we got a Bible teaching for you? You know, when I say that, it makes me feel silly and I start thinking about things from days gone by like, have we got a show for you? Veggie Tales. Ve How many people grew up like teaching their kids Veggie Tales or maybe you guys grew up with Veggie Tales and you get those songs just stuck in your head? Oh my goodness. Do you know they have a thing out called Veggie Rocks? Where they take those same Veggie Tail songs and like seriously hard rock them. It's actually pretty cool. But that's not what our Bible teaching is about today. Um, you know what? I really love one of the greatest things doing these videos is having people get it, having people come to a, a, a deeper relation, a understanding of truths. Wow. But even having people pick up on some biblical truths you know, regarding prophecy is really, really cool. And it's not so much that I tell somebody something and they go like, oh, I got it, I get it. But it's when people start digging in by themselves because of something they hear or whatever. That just gives me that great, awesome feeling. You had a guy like, you know, I couldn't understand. Um, you know, everybody was saying Rosh Hashanah, I mean, rapture it at... at um, what is it, Tisha B'Av, the ninth of Av, and you came along saying it can only be on Rosh Hashanah. And that man's understanding of the Bible has completely changed. Um, him, his family, his friends, oh my goodness, what a huge change in their life. Um, and it's not necessarily just prophecy. Having somebody say, thank you so much for getting me off the rapture roller coaster, that it can only happen on Rosh Hashanah. But I had a, a, a something like that happen the other day. They're like, you know, when you spoke about Jan, I don't even know how to pronounce it, Jan Hackaseth, I started digging into it. And wow, it's connected to Psalm 27.5. And um, that looks like it's a secret rapture. I wouldn't say it's so secret. Psalm 27.5, Psalm 27 is my favorite rapture passage. And I've done several teachings on this. And I'm going to do a short one today on it um, and sort of build into it. And I will attach a longer teaching to this. It'll be in the, um, not the, com the comments, the notes, uh, the description. It'll be there. So you might want to check that out. I'm also going to attach, I did a series, Why Rosh Hashanah. There's, what, nine or ten teachings about Why Rosh Hashanah. I am going to attach the one about Jan Hakaseth. I think I'm pronouncing it right, to that, okay? So let's go ahead, let's open up our Bibles, and we're going to get started. Actually, I'm going to go online a little bit, and I want to show you a couple things first. And Jan Hakaseth. Rosh Hashanah is called Jan Hakaseth. Um, I'm mispronouncing it. I'm terrible. I was a math person, not an English person, or a Hebrew person for that sake. Matter. For the day it is for the day of hiding, because it was hidden from Satan, Asatan, the adversary. The Bible says that Satan comes to rob and to steal, John 10:10, 10, 10, and to confuse 1 Corinthians 14:33. And if you go down, you'll see Jan Hekaseth, the, the hidden day. Um, nobody knows no, the day no man knows. When they say no man knows the day or the hour, this is what it's talking about, this hidden concealed day. But not only is it a hidden and concealed day, it's the day that we will be concealed in the Father's house. Okay. Um, in Psalm 27.5, it is written, so that in the for in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion, in his seek this in the secret of his tabernacle he shall hide me. He shall set me upon a rock. Wow. The time of trouble is tribulation. He's gonna hide us away in his pavilion. This is actually really cool when you really understand it. So I'm going to go do, give a brief, and for me, I don't do brief well. You know, brief for me is like two hours. That's brief. You want to really talk about something, let's do a 10, you know, video series. Um, yeah, so let's go to the book of Psalms. 
and verse uh, chapter 27 and see what David has to say. Is David a prophet? Oh, yeah. What? Somebody's out there wondering if David is a prophet? Come on, really? Okay, let's go someplace else. We're going to do Psalms. Let's go to Psalm 22 real quick just to show you that he's a prophet. And that's not Psalm 22. Yeah, I'm in my head thinking. Sometimes I don't follow and get to the right places when I'm thinking like this. All right. You know how Messiah is on the cross? And what did he say? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Okay, it's probably not quite said like that. How does Psalm 22 start? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Let's go down a little bit. I am poured out like water. My bones are all out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within me. My, str my strength is dried up like pots herd. What's pots herd? I'm not sure. And my tongue clings to my jaws. You have brought me to the dust of death. For dogs have surrounded me. Um, Got to defend the dogs. These are people who have sold themselves out. It says male cult prostitutes, but it's like people who have sold themselves to somebody else. These would have been the leaders of Israel. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed upon me. They pierce my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. Why? Because he got whipped almost to death. They, can't, they, they divide my garments among them, and they cast my clothing for lots. 1,000 years before Messiah was crucified, David wrote all about it. Excuse me. Yeah, he did. David wrote all about it. So when Messiah is up on the cross saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What he's actually saying, and have, 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 have you heard a pastor say, um, you know, God had to forsake Jesus because he was about to go into the depths of hell to preach to the people there. Actually, he's bringing captive, cap, um, captivity captive. He's taking those souls who were waiting, who were going to be going to heaven. He took those souls up to heaven with him. The bodies will join them later. Uh, anyhow. They said, yeah, Jesus couldn't go there. No, that's not what he's saying. God, he is God. God cannot forsake himself. He's saying, hey, guys, I know it looks terrible. I'm getting whipped. I'm getting beating. I'm blooding everywhere. I'm about to die. But hey, this had to happen. David wrote about it. Go back and see what David said. Because whenever a teacher, Messiah was a teacher, he's a rabbi, that means teacher, mentions something out of scripture, he's asking you to go back and Look at it. Sorry, a little tangent there. But yes, Messiah was, excuse me, David was a prophet. All right, let's go where, where we're heading. We were headed to Psalm 27. Somebody needed to hear that. So David, was David one of these guys that just had this beautiful life and perfect life that, you know, he just had to draw close to the Messiah because everything in his life was so perfect. Yeah, no. David had it rougher than you and I will ever know. Having the king and the armies of his own country try to hunt him down uh, because of his righteousness and the king's unrighteousness. Mona story. By the way, do you never notice how it said that David like snipped off a piece of... Uh, like a corner of his garment, King Saul's, yeah, that'd be the tallit, the little tassel thing that contains 713 twists and turns that represent the law. That's what he cut off. I wonder if that was God saying that he was cutting Saul off from him. Yeah. So David didn't have an easy life, okay? In fact, I'd be willing to bet there are people out there that have issues. Maybe you have issues with your sons, your daughters, with financial situation, with stress, with medical issues. Oh, my goodness. With psychological issues, with um, just dealing with people in your life that's, oh, my goodness, how do I deal with these people? That boss at work. I know I am that boss at work. I have my own small business. I can be annoying to people at times. We've all got issues in our life. The thing is, a lot of times people blame them all on Satan, and Satan does have spiritual attacks, but some of them are our own choosing and our own decisions, and we need to retake responsible for that which is ours. But my point is, David had it a lot worse than any of us. Let's look at his perspective. 
The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? That's great. If, if the Lord is your light and your salvation, and that word salvation there is Yeshua, who is our salvation, whom shall I fear? Nobody. The Lord is, is the strength of my life. Whom shall I be afraid of? Nobody, because you have Messiah. You know your future. When the wicked come against me to eat up my flesh, my enemies and foes, they stumbled and fell. God took care of them. And no, they weren't really eating up his flesh, but he's saying that's how much, that's what they want to do to him. They want to really torture him to kill him, everything else. Though an army may be encamped against me. Anybody ever feel like they got an army encamped against them? I have at times. Seems like there's everything coming against you. My heart shall not fail or fear. The war may rise around against me. Of this, I will be confident. So they, he's got like some serious rap going on in his life. And he says, of this, I will be confident. This is where we get to the good part. The one thing I have desired in my life. Whenever I read this, the one thing, I can't help but thinking about Billy Crystal in the movies, uh, City Slickers, when he's talking to the old, um, you know, cattle driving guy, Curly. And he's like, one thing, one thing, you know, that one thing in your life that drives you. This is, this is what it is for David. The one thing I've desired from the Lord that I will seek. So it's not like I'm just, okay, then I'm going to seek it. Is seeking something is sitting around waiting for it to happen? No. That you're actively looking for. You're actively searching. It. You're actually a actively doing what you need to do to get there. It's an active thing. You're seeking. It's not once saved, always saved. It's a continual thing. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord all of the days of my life to inquire the beauty of the Lord. To behold, I'm sorry, to behold the beauty of the Lord. To behold, to see it, to experience it. Do we ever really see the beauty of the Lord? I mean, yes, we see the things that he does. We see creation. We see things that he does. But we don't actually see him. It looks like he's saying he's actually going to see him. And inquire in his temple. Hmm, interesting. See, the key to this verse is in that phrase, all the days of my life. I'm told in the original Hebrew that the word life is plural. I don't see it here when I do the tools. But let's look at where this phrase is also used, and that'll give us a clue. Hmm, I forget which one it is. Try of my life. Let's see where else it is. I think this is it. So it's it's David uses it, and it should be in that section. Right here, Psalm twenty three six. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Hmm, all the days of my life is forever. It's this life and the life to come. And that's how it reads in the Hebrew. So let's go back to Psalm 27. The one thing I desire that I will seek is to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And to behold the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in his temple. Can you imagine, there'll be a day that we can go into Messiah's temple to ask questions, to inquire of him. You know, my, my thing, if heaven's a perfect place, how did angels fall? I don't know, that's my question. Silly question, I'm sure. Maybe I'll just know the answer already by the time I get there. And, you know, for me, I get there and Messiah is going to be like, another one? Come on, this is the 1,275,162nd time I've answered that question. No, I doubt it would be like that. But we're going to be able to inquire in the house of the Lord. That's really cool. For in the time of rubble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. That word hide me right there 
is what connects back to Yom Hakaseth, the day of hiding, that you will be hidden in his pavilion. Okay, that's what we're looking at. That he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret place of the, his tabernacle, he shall hide me. He shall set me high upon a rock. Going to hide me twice, making sure you know you're going to be hidden. See, that secret place, you'll see that throughout Scripture. Um, it's basically that when they would take their prayer cloth and they pull it over their head and down, it's a covering, okay? But it's also, that is the one-on-one -on -one time with Messiah. This is the prayer closet. I know, I know. It says, but it says closet. The rooms didn't have closets back then. This is that secret place where you come between to the Lord. It's also that covering is what a man would put over his wife. It's representative of the covering, the sukkah, that will cover us in the millennial kingdom. It is representative of the hadar. Is it the hadar? I get my words wrong, but that a Jewish man and woman get married under. Okay, that's the covering, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. Um, where do I want to go? In the longer video, I'm going to cover more verses here. But he shall hide me. Is there another scripture that's specific about the rapture that talks about being hidden? Let's go to Isaiah. This is when I love when people say, you know, the post-tribbers or whatever. The rapture was a invention of John Darby in the 1800s. Tell David that. Tell Isaiah that. They got it. What they didn't get is that let me, let me do a quick little rabbit trail here real quick. And here's what they didn't quite understand. Okay, we're going to start, and this is the last verse. I, last video I went to, I went to this verse, Amos 3, 7. This is how God talks to us. This is the sods, the deepest level of Hebraic hermeneutics. You have the persat, the duresh, the remiz, the sod. It's the mystery level. Things that are hidden in Scripture, not meant to be understood another time. Surely God does nothing unless he reveals his secret. That word is sowed to his servants, the prophet. Now, if I looked up the definition of sowed, it's not going to tell me the deepest level of Hebraic hermeneutics. But if you look up and you do your research about the, deep, the levels of Hebraic hermeneutics, you will find that. The mystery level. Was there anybody that wanted to show us a mystery? There's actually quite a few verses about Messiah and Paul wanting to show us mysteries. Okay, this is what they are. They're so. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. What does that word sleep? Does that mean we're not, some people are just not going to sleep at all. They're going to stay up 24 hours a day forever and ever. And if they do that, what are they going to need? Lots of coffee. Mmm. Put on another pot, not sleeping. No. These are dead people. These are dead people who are going to come to life in Messiah. It talks about them sleeping. The Kia de Gallia, de Gola, is the awakening blast. That's the trumpet blast that wakes them up, and it's blown on Rosh Hashanah. All right. So what Paul is saying in the mystery that, that he's showing us, the so the something that was hidden in Scripture, not meant to be revealed until another time, is that dead people, excuse me, that live people will be raptured. You know, back when Messiah brought Lazarus back to life, we'll see what the common understanding of the day was. Understand a day is a thousand years. 
Martha said to him, I know that we will all rise again in the resurrection at the last day. What she wasn't getting, they, they knew there was a resurrection that the dead would be rised. They didn't get that live people were going to be rised. Were rise. Let's go back to Isaiah, and I'm going to try to conclude this. I didn't want this to be a real long one, but hey, I don't do short well. What can I say? Isaiah 26, starting in verse 19. Your dead shall live. Together with my dead body, they shall arise. What's Isaiah actually saying here? When the rapture happens, I'm... That's what he's saying. My dead body is going to rise together when the dead or the dead shall live. Together with my dead body. Awake and sing. That's the awakening blast. Okay? Whenever you see, like, awake, it could be rapture. Because that's the awakening blast. That's the last trumpet. What do we do when we're in the heaven after the rapture? Yep, we'll be singing a new song. You who dwell in the dust, dead people, sleeping people. That's why they're awakening, the awakening blast. For your dew is like the dew of the herbs, and the earth shall cast out its dead. So the earth already cast out its dead. My people, enter your chambers and shut the door behind you. It doesn't say dead people. These are live people. That's what, must, that's what, this is what Paul's telling us that live people are going to go to and shut the doors behind you. We spoke in the last video, Rosh Hashanah, the doors are open, Yom Kippur, they're closed. Yeah, we want to get in there before it's too late. Hide yourself, as it were, for a little moment until the indignation is passed. So we're going to be hidden away during the time of Jacob's troubles, during tribulation. For behold, the Lord comes out of his place to, in, to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their in, inequity. What do we call that day? Armageddon. We come with him. But the cool thing is, we're not going to be, um, how do I word this? We're not going to be doing the fighting. We just watch. It's the sword of his mouth, the word of God that he uses. He speaks, it's over. The earth shall disclose her blood and no more cover over her slain. Mm. See this word chambers? That's the wedding chamber. And if I clicked on that word, it's not going to quite tell me that. In Hebrew, they would get it. So let's look at where else this word is used. The Hadar. That's the wedding chamber. But it doesn't really come out and say that. The chamber, inner bedroom, bed chamber, bed chamber, inner parts, innermost parts, parlor, chamber room, parlor. You know, it gives you all this, but it doesn't really say it's the wedding chamber. It's the room that's built onto the father's house. Let's go to Joel. Anybody that's been around, heard my teachings, you know that Joel too. We're just going to start the beginning. Roll two is your rapture, the feast of trumpets, the beginning of the year. Um, Blow the trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. It's at hand. you got several things working here. First of all, this is the day of the Lord. The last thousand years, which starts at the rapture and tribulation. And they're blowing the trumpet. Of course, it's Rosh Hashanah. It's the feast of trumpets. Those two days are connected. They don't separate the sound of an alarm in my holy mountain war is coming that's a psalm 83 war you take down the inhabitant you break down the inhabitants of psalm 83 and you start researching them in scripture and you find a little phrase that's connected with them and it says in that day you're seeing dual prophecy most of those things you come across are going to be about the time of um, nebuchadnezzar who God says, my servant, Nebuchadnezzar, when he conquered the known world. But he keeps saying, in that day, dual prophecy. Let the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming, for it is at hand. And then you're going to read all through here. And this is tribulation. There's a call to repentance. Turn with me for all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. When does Israel 
uh, the, the remnant of Israel get saved? Out of tribulation. Out of. In the middle of. You can read about that in Jeremiah 30. To rend your heart, not your garments. Return to the Lord your God. Okay, this is for them. This is when it's over. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Consecrate a fast. Call a sacred assembly. That's actually in Hebrew, a concluding assembly. What day is this? Well, there's only one biblically mandated fast day where they're blowing a trumpet. Yeah, it's Yom Kippur. That is the great trumpet. You read about the sound of a great trumpet in the tail end of Matthew 24. That's the end of tribulation, not the rapture. It's not the last trumpet. It's a great trumpet. Gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, the nursing babe, let the bridegroom go out of his chamber and the bride her dressing room. This is Christ, Messiah, Yeshua, our Savior, our Lord, coming back with the church, with all the saints with her, after tribulation right here. And they're, and she's coming out of the bridal chamber. You have to understand. Um, John 10. Or is it John 14? I think it's 14. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. They're one and the same. He's talking to his disciples. In my father's house, there are many mansions. These are bridal chambers. And if it were not so, I would have told you. We go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and to receive you to myself. This is the rapture where he's going to go and prepare a place. He will come back to get us to be where he's at. This is the wedding feast. This is how it was done. The, the, the groom would come. These, he gets betrothed to his wife. They're legally married. They ain't doing anything yet. Uh-uh, they're keeping themselves apart. And he goes back to his father's room to prepare a place for them. Okay? Then he would come back to get her. And that's when the wedding ceremony happens. Um, what is the day of the wedding feast of Messiah? Excuse me. Not wedding feast. The wedding day of Messiah is Rosh Hashanah. The wedding feast happens during tabernacles, during the millennial kingdom. Seriously, there's a name for it. The wedding feast happens during tabernacles, which represents the thousand-year millennial reign. So Messiah is saying, I'm going to go. And if I go to prepare a place, I'm going to come back to bring you with me. I'm going to rapture you. And they don't get it. Jesus never talked about the rapture. Jesus spoke about the kingdom of heaven. And he says, and where I go, you know the way. You, you know, I'm sorry, and where I go, you know, and you know the way. Thomas, surprised it's not Peter speaking out. Peter's the one that usually speaks out. Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? You've got a bunch of guys hanging out. You're talking about getting married? Really? Hmm. That doesn't make sense. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Um, yeah, the rapture can only happen on Rosh Hashanah. When you understand scripture and you understand how these things fit together and you understand the Hebrew behind stuff, it's very, very clear. But see, I like David's words. Oh, my goodness. It doesn't. I want to go back one more time to Psalm 27. Hey, guys, we're going through some stuff. I am. You are. And you know what? Things are going to get worse. And I'm not saying because of a comment. Um, look up the words. Look up what's said in the Jewish Talmud, the commandments of men, about, the, about comments and being judgment. It's actually comical. It really is. I've got a video. I need to listen to it through to make sure I want to put it out there that I speak about this. Um. But the one thing, that one thing to desire of the Lord that you seek, you're going to go after. You're going to live your life in a way that you know you're going to get there. That you will be with the Lord forever. That's what matters. But you know what? We're here on this earth right now. And we're only here to get a ticket to go there. But we want to bring as many people along with us we can. We want to bring as many people to the Lord as we can. 
it's not so much that we do it, it's the Holy Spirit does it, but he does it through us. We are given that ministry of reconciliation. Do me a favor. I want you to pray, pray this prayer with me. Father God, thank you for what you've done so many years ago, Lord, so that I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that I have a future, an eternity with you in heaven. Father God, help me to share that with somebody. But Lord, I need you to open up your eyes. Put those opportunities before me, Lord. But open up my eyes so that I can see them, Lord. I can be so blind. And Lord, give me your words to speak. Lord, my words are weak and useless. Your words have power and strength and life. Give me your words, Lord. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, I offer up this prayer. Amen. If you're in the Word of God and you're reading you know, Scripture and studying Scripture and you say that prayer, He will answer that prayer. And just don't worry about the words. He'll give you the words. Ask Him for them. But if you're in His Bible, that's how He gives them to you. You know, I thank you for listening, folks. God bless you. Um, let's not miss a chance to share Messiah while it's still daylight, while we still can. God bless you.